We arrived in the town square next to your magnificent hall, and I was on the open top double decker, and it was raining, it often does in Lancashire, and it was the day that the microphones broke, they got wet. So I had to give a speech to the assembled throng without a microphone, and I was hoarse for days. But I remember after my day here in Bolton, thinking to myself just how utterly and completely disconnected Westminster politics have become compared to towns like Bolton. And I thought after that day, we are going to win this referendum. And it is, it is a remarkable thing to think that 2016 is one of those years that children will read about in history books in one or 200 years' time. They will read that 2016 was a year of political revolution. Political revolution in the United Kingdom. Huge, that's the word he uses quite a lot, huge political revolution in America. And of course we saw uh, in December the Italians getting rid of their Prime Minister in a referendum. It was a year of political revolution and the most remarkable thing about it is, it was all started by UKIP. Now there are some, there are some who think that that revolution of 2016 is nothing more than a blip. It's nothing more than a blip and that we will all come back to our collective senses across the Western world and return to that comfortable mid-late 1990s consensus. I have to tell you, I am now absolutely certain that the political revolution of 2016 was actually just the beginning of something very much bigger that is going to happen across the entire Western world. The, the change in public attitudes towards politics, towards the political class, towards large sections of our establishment liberal media, those changes in attitudes are absolutely fundamental. Far from receding, they are growing with every month that goes by. And I think that anyone that looked at the Chatham House polling that was released this week, 10 major European countries were polled, and eight of those 10, one of which was not the UK actually, but eight of those 10, over 50% of those populations said they wanted a total end to all immigration from predominantly Muslim countries. Now, what is, what is remarkable about this is that people like myself or people like Trump, who have been held up to hold the most outrageous political views. I mean, Trump wanted to bring in a 90-day suspension, didn't he? Whilst he worked out what his vetting policy was but people like Trump and myself, far from leading public opinion, now find ourselves firmly on the left of where public opinion is across Europe now. It is that fundamental. People, people aren't interested in arguments about the economy, in arguments about growth, in arguments politicians make about jobs. They're not interested. Do you know why? Because they simply don't believe what they're being told. After all, wasn't our economy going to fall off a cliff if we voted for Brexit? No, what people care about is national identity. What people care about is their community. And I would argue that people in this country and across the West are now beginning to see immigration as a far bigger issue than they even saw it during the referendum campaign last year. None of this is going away. I don't know whether 2017 is the year in which we see dramatic government changes in Europe or not. I don't yet know whether it's going to happen in 2017, but believe me, radical change is coming, and it's coming in the course of the next few years. All of which I think makes it all the more amusing to see that Tony Blair 
gosh, I thought you were all asleep for a moment there. <laughs> all of which makes it more remarkable that Tony Blair is standing up today and saying that the British need to rethink Brexit. He seems to think we're going to change our minds. He clearly hasn't grasped that if that referendum was held tomorrow, the margin would be at least three times bigger than it was in the June of last year. <laughs> now Blair, is, Blair is yesterday's man. He's like the heavyweight world champion who's been retired for a few years but needs a bout to make some money and he comes back and he gets knocked out in the first round. And by the end of today, Blair will be on the canvas, all right? But there is, there is, with this big attitudinal change that is taking place across the West, there is, I think, a very important message for UKIP. A message that UKIP needs to think about. A message that UKIP needs to act upon. This party went from nothing to being the first party to win a national election as we did in 2014. The first party since 1906 to win a national election, to force a referendum and to play a very important part in that campaign. This party succeeded because we were prepared to think the unthinkable. This party succeeded because we were prepared to speak the unspeakable. This party succeeded because we had guts, we had passion, we were brave, and we were unafraid of criticism. That's why we succeeded. <laughs> but now I sense that there are too many people in UKIP whose jobs and positions have come directly as a result of that bold strategy who are now urging UKIP to become mainstream. Now, I understand this. It's nice to be popular. It's good to get invited to all the right social set parties in London. And I guess it is easier in life to be thought of as being nice rather than one of those unpleasant populists. But this attitude folks, is not UKIP. UKIP is a radical party or it is nothing. So we need to be, we need to be unafraid and bold in all that we do. We need to be leading the political conversation, not trying to sound like all of the rest. And goodness me, there is an awful lot to do. You know, Mrs May is saying all the right things, isn't she? She's saying all the right things. It sounds great, doesn't it? Brexit means Brexit. We're leaving the single market. Uh, our borders are not up for negotiation. But just think on this. It's now over seven months since we voted in that referendum. And what has happened so far? Nothing. Thank you. Nothing. And if we enter into this two-year process, by the end of that two-year process, we will have paid in, net, the best part of £30 billion. We still have a complete open door to 485 million people. I don't know from the date of Brexit to the date of leaving how many more people will have net entered this country, but I bet you, even from the European Union alone, it'll be pushing on towards half a million. And my big worry is this, that as Home Secretary, she gave some tremendous party conference speeches, didn't she? Wonderful, top-thumping stuff about how she was going to deal with immigration and bring the numbers down to tens of thousands. Well, she failed spectacularly as Home Secretary, despite those good words. And whilst I've been trying my absolute best to give her the benefit of the doubt, and I have, even if she doesn't want me as her ambassador in Washington, <laughs> she
shame, really, although I'd never necessarily... I'd never necessarily put the words Farage and diplomat in the same sentence, but... But we are living in a different time. No, I've tried. <laughs> Would have been a great wine cellar, wouldn't it? I've tried to give her the benefit of the doubt, and yet just this week, I see a report coming out from the European Union Commission telling us that it's going to be too difficult to extricate Britain from the common fisheries policy. And I listen to our fisheries minister, George Eustace, who says that Brexit should be good for the British fishing industry because we can argue for better quotas. We didn't fight and win that referendum to argue with a begging bowl in Brussels for better quotas. We did it because we voted to take back control of our nation, its laws, its borders and its territorial waters. And we have, and we have the most phenomenal opportunity with many millions of Labour voters, particularly in places like Bolton, for whom now the Labour Party is utterly and fatally disconnected. We've seen the death of the Labour Party in Scotland, and I sense that the Labour Party is beginning to lose much of its sense of purpose in England and Wales right now. Whatever uh, Mr Corbyn's attributes may be, I lost my place there, that was all. <laughs> Whatever Mr Corbyn's attributes may be, um, he basically isn't patriotic. He won't sing the national anthem. He wants to give away the Falkland Islands. He won't condemn the IRA. He is miles away from working class Britain. They need a champion, and that is UKIP's opportunity. <laughs> Now, I think everybody in UKIP sees this opportunity and understands this opportunity. But what I'm saying today is that in terms of the direction that UKIP chooses, just because we see that potential with huge numbers of Labour voters does not mean that UKIP, as some would argue, should head for the centre. You won't pick up millions of Labour voters unless you have a clear strong and true message. Just look at what Trump did in the Midwest of America to pick up Democrat voters and non-voters. He didn't do it by tacking to the left. He did it by being clear. And whether people agreed with the whole of his platform or not, that was enough to win the votes in those key swing states. And I believe it's the same for UKIP in the Midlands, the North and parts of South Wales. We must not change our policy. We must be seen to be those that fight against political correctness. We must be seen as the party that is moving on the national debate the whole time. And I guess right now, all of that comes to a head next Thursday in Stoke. And I don't think anybody, uh, for one moment, can underplay just how important, just how fundamental that by-election is for the futures of both the Labour Party and indeed of UKIP too. It matters and it matters hugely. And I know that Paul has had a very, very difficult week. Mind you, I think the Labour candidate in Stoke has had an even harder week. So, you know, by, fighting by-elections is not much fun. It's a rough old game. But from what I can see on the ground, and that, from that meeting I spoke at last Monday, from what I can see, I do believe we can win this by-election. I do believe we're going to win this by-election. But we won't, we won't win it by sitting at home and waiting for the results to come through at two or three o'clock in the morning. The one thing the Labour Party are able to do and are capable of doing is they're good at mobilising a polling day army. And some in this region will remember the by-election of Haywood and Middleton, where at 6pm very few people thought there was any other result likely 
than a UKIP win. And yet by 10 o'clock, Labour were out. They had 50 MPs knocking on doors until 10 to 10, trying to get their vote out. And they got their vote out, and they beat us by 600 votes. We can prevent that from happening on what is going to be a wet Thursday in Stoke. And we can do it, ladies and gentlemen, by getting our walking boots on, by being mobilised, and by going out and having conversations in Stoke with people that believe in what we stand for. And we've got to tell them, you've got to go out, not just voting on June the 23rd last year, you've got to vote, you've got to go out and give that same message again. And if I can leave you with one big thought, it is please physically do everything you can to help get Paul Nuttall elected as the MP for Stoke Central next Thursday. Thank you very much indeed.